I want to welcome everybody to um, our monthly training and meeting sessions from the Quattrone Center for folks who are engaged in post-conviction litigation and investigations. This is made possible by a grant from the Bureau of Justice Administration. We provide these trainings monthly um, under a grant under the Wrongful Convictions Program for anybody who is engaged in litigating and investigating claims of wrongful conviction. This month, we are just so happy to have with us to, uh, folks from the National Regist Registry of Exoneration, in particular, Maurice Posley, who is a senior researcher at the Exoneration Registry. I think all of you on this call have heard about the registry, have seen the registry, probably rely on the registry for your work that you do, grant proposals or other work and even promoting your own policies. So uh, we invited the folks from the registry here to talk about what they do and how they, pardon me, gather and report on their data, but also to give some sense to the people on this call about how you can use the registry more for making arguments for policy changes within your own jurisdictions by backing it up with the data that we have nationally because of the incredible work of the people at the exoneration registry. So, um, in addition to Maurice, we have Jessica Weinstock Paradis, who is another researcher at the Exoneration Registry, and we're both so happy to have you both here. Um, so, as usual, I'm going to turn it over to them and let them kind of take the wheel. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will keep an eye on the chat um, and, and be able to relay those questions out to Maurice and Jessica as they come up. Um, and we'll, we'll obviously try to save some time at the end also for questions or dialogue about data, about why it's important, why you should be keeping it, and how. So I, we have Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Maurice Posley with us. Maurice, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to shut up now, take down my screen, and turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar names um, out there. And uh, I'm going to just go right into it, actually. Um, Make sure that this works. Can you all see that? Wait a minute. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Yes, we can see it and we can hear you, Maurice. Okay, cool. So, um, but we can't see the screen if you're sharing, just you. I can see the screen. I can see the screen. It says National Registry of Exonerations navigating the registry. We got you, Maurice. Keep All going. Right. So um, just the basics. It's a three university project. Um, it's online. It's 10 years old as of May. Uh, it was originally founded by Rob Warden at Northwestern uh, Center on Wrongful Convictions and Sam Gross at the University of Michigan. Uh, it started with uh, about 900 cases and we just topped 3,300. So um, we like to say that we do two things, we count things and we tell stories. Um, so our definition basically is someone who is officially cleared based on new evidence of innocence. Um, there's a more detailed, um, version on the website, but it basically comes down to you have to be convicted, you have to be relieved of the consequences of that conviction. Um, typically it's by, it's vacated and then dismissed. Um, and there has to be some evidence that's favorable to the defendant that wasn't presented at the time of conviction, whether it's a plea or a jury or bench. Um, and so when it's new, it, it can also be not new, but not presented. Um, and that's typical and typically in an ineffective assistance of counsel where a defense lawyer doesn't present evidence like an alibi or an expert. Um, if you have a pardon based on innocence, um, that gets you in, but uh, it's typically, as I described, conviction vacated, dismissed. Um, here's another way to uh, put it. Um, there can't be unexplainable physical evidence of guilt, and, and that's typically in a drug case. Um, and an example would be someone who is convicted in a, a drug case, and then subsequently it's determined that the arresting officer had 
credibility issues that weren't disclosed. And so the state agrees to vacate it. Um, and unless there's some uh, explanation that's synonymous with innocence about the suitcase full of cocaine that was in the trunk of the car, um, it doesn't make the party because of this unexplainable physical evidence of guilt. And if someone gets a certificate of innocence or a declaration of innocence, um, that can that will qualify. Um, where that comes into play typically is when someone gets their conviction reversed on insufficient evidence. And as part of the compensation process or part of they they will get a certificate of innocence. Um, if your case is reversed on flat insufficient evidence, it doesn't meet the criteria that requires that there be some evidence that wasn't pre presented at the time that was favorable to the defendant. Uh, we don't include people who take Alfred pleas, um, although we try to keep track of those. Um, people who are get a new trial and then they are acquitted at a retrial, but there isn't this evidence. A typical is when I'll call a defense lawyer and I'll say, I just did the cross better. The evidence didn't change. Um, and if you're cleared of some, but not all, um, you, you, that does not qualify. Um, you have to be relieved of all the consequences. Um, and so uh, it's all part, if it's all part of the same stream of crime, um, you have to be, everything has to go away. Um, so who are we? We're a small shop. Myself, Ken Otterberg, um, and Jessica, who is with us today, and Ken is out there too, I know. Um, and then we have uh, Simon Cole, uh, who's the director, Barbara O'Brien is the editor, and of course, Sam Gross, um, who um, says he's retired, but he still likes to meddle, and we appreciate that. Um, as I say, we're pretty small. Um, we're spread out. Um, we were into Zoom before Zoom was popular, and um, we get a lot uh, done just despite, I think, in part because we're small, so we're a little bit more nimble, but we also work very hard. So we collect data. We collect it before exoneration. When we hear, hear about um, cases um, that one day might possibly be an exoneration, we will gather uh, reach out and gather information. Some of you um, may know um, that I've reached out when a, a, a person has gotten a new trial and to see if there's pleadings that we can have. Um, we have what we call our standby file. It's a giant electronic calendar um, that has, it ranges, it's now about 550. It's been over 600. And these are cases that come to us through um, Google Alerts, news reports that we um, hear about where it, the, the media typically, if someone gets a new trial, they use that term. So you, if you use it in quotes, you can, it's not a 100% net, but it catches a lot of them. And so we'll put them in there. Um, you know, Ken and I can tell you that as journalists, and you probably know this, that you might get arrested on the front page, convicted on the front page, reversed back in the back and dismissed way, way in the back or not at all. And so by following some of these, we find out about cases that qualified that we wouldn't have otherwise done. And then of course, after exoneration, we reach out and look for um, documents and data that we can use so that we can code the cases and, and write the summaries. Um, we get information from uh, Innocence Projects, from CIUs, from news reports, from, we get emails from lawyers, family members, exonerees. Um, occasionally an exoneree will reach out and say, I think I should be in there. And well, send us what you got. And turns out they're right. Um, we follow compensation um, and lawsuits. Uh, Jeff Gutman uh, is a professor at uh, GW at Law School who's been studying compensation and works closely with us um, and is writing um, reports and summaries that are going to are available um, on the website uh, about the issue of compensation. And we've become much more robust in our collection of data um, with the help of Jeff. Um, so what do we collect? Well, post-conviction pleadings are typically the key because that's 
um, what's led to this person getting a new trial um, or dismissal. But uh, appellate decisions, trial transcripts, um, post-trial hearing transcripts, post-conviction exhibits, news stories, photographs. We try to get as much as we can. We keep it all on a huge Google Drive um, organized by um, the name of the exoneree. Uh, we have the separate files for those who are in our standby file as well. Um, the more that we can get, the better we can code it um, and the more complete we can be in terms of not only the coding, but writing the um, summary. So the way it sort of works is that um, Ken and I, um, once we have a case that, as we say, will make the party, um, we read the pleadings, begin to fill in the blanks in the coding form, has more than 100 variables. Uh, then we create, um, there's my first typo that I've noticed, uh, a narrative summary. Um, and the first review is by Jessica. Um, and she looks and compares the coding to the summary and notes inconsistencies, raises questions about why we've coded things a particular way. Uh, an example would be, um, was this a mistake in witness identification or was it a lie? Now our default is mistake, unless we have some um, evidence um, that suggests that it was a lie. Uh, recantation is typical, um, uh, but those are the kinds of questions that Jess, who has an extremely sharp eye for this sort of thing, goes through um, and makes that first pass. And then she sends it back to us and say, says, you know, I think you should fix this. Um, your math is bad. The age at the time of the crime is wrong, which is a common mistake that I make. Um, and once we uh, have agreed, then it goes to um, Barbara O'Brien or, or Simon Cole. Um, and they go through it and then it comes back and we, um, Ken or I, whoever does has written a summary, look at whatever questions they've raised um, or, and try to resolve those. And then Jess gives it one final review and then it's posted for the public. Um, it can take it, it, it can take a week, it can happen in a couple of days, it can take a couple of weeks. It just sort of depends. Um, it can be right now we sort of have a backlog. Um, pardon? Anyway. Oh, you're good. I think it was just a random okay. noise. Coding. So we code these factors um, as contributing factors. And Maurice, just for those of us who are not as familiar with the terminology, when you say code, what exactly do you mean? Well, behind what you see on the website is a, a coding scheme. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of that. Um, I could try to do it now. Uh, no, I'm not gonna do it. Now, yeah, um, if there's a definition it, it, for the term or what it means. Well, what it means is that what you see on the public display are all the results of what is put into um, a, a form that's on a SharePoint is the, the software, I guess, um, that's on the Michigan uh, law website or their, their, their computer. Um, and that translates some reports publicly and some doesn't. Um, but it's the data that we collect. And I'm gonna give you some examples of, um, for instance, in official misconduct. But these are the main contributing, these are the six contributing factors that we code. Each one of these has internally subcategories um, that allow us to discriminate. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, you'll see on the detailed view, what we call the, the main search page of, of the registry, tags. There's a column called tags and you can sort by these tags. Uh, you can only sort by one tag at a time, but you can um, find all the cases with these elements. You can find all the arson element, cases. You can find all the bite mark cases. Um, Co-defendant confessed. That's an interesting, I bold faced it because it's an interesting 
um, category of uh, a false confession um, where someone falsely implicates um, the exoneree. Um, you can sort by conviction integrity unit and find all the ones that um, are attributed to uh, CIUs. Uh, we just added a juvenile tag. We have gotten a lot of requests in the past for um, information on juveniles. And the only way prior to this would be to download the database and sort for yourself. Now you can actually pull up everyone who's under the was under the age of 18 at the time of the crime. Um, and also a fairly recent tag is uh, sex assault. This catches cases where someone was, there was a sexual assault and a, a murder, for example, but the only crime that was charged and that they were convicted of was murder. So it's a way to catch all the, and just knows she was the, in, in charge of that recoding project. So she knows it in great detail, but it, it basically allows you to get every case where there was a sexual assault involved. Um, most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, the no crime cases, um, these are cases where um, they pled guilty to drugs and the lab tests showed that there was no controlled substance. It was convicted of a murder and it was an accident or self-defense or a suicide. Um, those are all, um, I think, pretty interesting. We also, um, in the past year and a half, have introduced the official misconduct tags. Um, up until this time, you could only sort by official misconduct as a contributing factor and you didn't really know what was the misconduct. You could read the summary and try to discern it. Um, but now we have all these where you can sort on these tags and find out. And the reason that this is possible is um, there was a, uh, we issued a report in 2020 on official misconduct that covered first 2,400 exonerations. And um, to do that, it was a significant recoding project where we went back through the first 2,400. I say we, um, some, some folks did and, and broke it down based on our source documents um, into these categories. And so now you can actually find the answer to the questions um, of, how often was there perjury? Uh, how often was there misconduct in an interrogation? These are all things that are in, in the coding um, that you don't necessarily see on the front page until you do this search. And we had to update the coding, expand it to these categories, and then fill them out so that we could generate this information. Um, there's a, we call it the Tableau page, um, but there's a, uh, a page that you can access on the front of the website. It's one of the slides and the rotating slides that where you can sort by state, you can sort by crime. It's another way of looking at it. Um, it it's, it's kind of fun. Um, and it's, sometimes it's very quickly, you can get to whatever state or whatever you're looking for in a particular state. Um, this is just another example of, of looking at it. Um, and you can sort again by year, by crime, by contributing factor. You can get all the false confession cases and see where they are um, across the country. Um, so now behind the scenes, we're gonna talk about, this is the complete data set. We're talking about the coding. Um, we have these detail codes for interrogations, false confessions, recantations. Um, and these are some of the details that we capture this information on. And I'll give you an example of, uh, and we share this data. Um, I'll give you an example of how we used it. Um, the folks at Northwestern, Laura Nyrider, and others were um, working on legislation to bar the use of police from lying to juveniles during interrogation and 
came to us and said, do you have any data on how often police officers lie? And if we know about it um, and we code it, and this is, you can see, uh, this is an example where it says, you can see on the side of the screen, this is an example what the coding looks like, confession, yes, no. And then under it, interrogation, violence, that's a yes or no, uh, or don't know, inducements, feeding details, lying, audiovisual recorded in full and part, confession only, polygraph, Miranda, no parent, ruled admissible. So we were able to provide data on all the cases involving juveniles where it was a false confession and the data that we had showed that police had lied during the interrogation, which we know is legal, but, um, and they used that to persuade the legislature, help persuade the legislature to adopt that um, as a law. So Lori, there's, I'm sorry, there's a question in the chat, which I don't know if you can answer. It says, what is the maximum age to be considered a juvenile under this rubric? 17. 17. Okay. Um, anybody under the age of 18. Okay, thank you. And, and, and we have the age, so, you know, if, if if somebody says, well, I only want 16 year olds, um, you can sort by that age and find, or I want 16 and under. I mean, all that is sortable um, and find outable. Um, we just decided that we were gonna do it that way. You can, if you sort by the juvenile tag and then under the age column on the page, that we, the public page, sort by ascending order, It'll show youngest all the way up and they'll be in chronological order. So you can actually cut it off at 16 or 15 or whatever you want to do. Does that make sense? Um, the the uh, official misconduct codes that I talked about, um, those tags. Um, so we now have uh, uh, internally in the coding, before it was official misconduct, yes or no. And now we have, was it police officers, prosecutors? child welfare workers, forensic analysts, was exculpatory evidence concealed, describe it, was it substantive, was it impeachment? Um, and there's a number of codes that follow. Um, the entire blank coding form is something that we share on a confidential basis. Um, and so if some one of you want to look um, and, and see them, uh, we're happy to share it. Um, we just don't like to put it out on, you know, I-55. Um, and uh, we think that, you know, collecting as much data as possible is the best way to um, get some real sense of, of what happened. Um, that led to the report, um, which was uh, issued in September, 2020. All our reports are on the website. Under the reports tag um, uh, heading uh, across the top, um, including our annual reports. And um, let me talk to you a little bit about that. Well, uh, let me, well, before I do that, I'll back up. The annual reports reflect a moment in time. I spend a lot of time talking to journalists about this because they'll look up and say, uh, one of these reports that says um, there were um, X number of exonerations in 2020. Well, the day after the reports are issued, they're out of date um, because we're constantly adding cases that we find out about that occurred in the past. Um, the, the, in fact, the registry was originally conceived of by Rob Warden as a book, and he was gonna call it the Encyclopedia of Exonerations. Um, but he realized at some point that the day it came off the printing press, uh, it was out of date, it, it'd be a moment in time. And so the idea with Sam was to create this living, breathing um, database that um, constantly grows and is constantly being backfilled with cases that we find out about because you can't call up all the county clerk's offices in the country and say, hey, we had any cases that beat our criteria this month. Um, and so we don't know how many. Uh, we've added um, 
we just hit 400 cases that we've added uh, this year. And about 170 of them did ha happened prior to 2022. I think that's right. Jessica or Ken can maybe correct me, but, um, and so there's a, a, a tag in the front of the uh, registry a drop down under browse cases where it says most recent exonerations and you can, it has a, the most recent 50 posted cases and sometimes if, when you look at that you'll see because it has year of exoneration it'll show different years than 2022 um, and that's why. Um, so we have a page, most of you probably know about it uh, if you're in a CIU where we um, have a list of all the CIUs. We have two lists, those who have uh, had exonerations and those who have not. And we try to provide a link to the, um, a search that shows those that are in there. And, you know, our policy is we'll give you credit for the ones that you want to take credit for. Um, and that's why, and Jessica will talk a little bit about the, the annual survey that we do, um, but we want folks to call us and say, hey, we had this case um, and you should know about it. It should be in the database. Um, and we encourage people um, to do so and, and we hope that they, and they do. And um, some have even sent us individual summaries, um, which are, have been pretty decent drafts to tell you the truth. Um, we have, uh, this shows, uh, it's a resources drop down. We've since, this is a, a, not that old, but it's slightly old. We've broken resources up into resources and reports. So those are the two tabs, but under the resources, you'll see things like um, the newsletters, the uh, how to get the data as a spreadsheet. Um, it's as simple as filling out this thing and you get a spreadsheet. It's just that simple. Um, as you can see, the count on this was 2505. So I'm, I'm, I am about 800 cases behind um, based on this slide. Um, how do I make it go? Oh, come on. There we go. We have this. These are an example of some of the infographics. These are dated, but as you can see, conviction integrity units, 44 nationwide. There's now 96, I think. But these are some examples of the things that are in there and things that we can create with our data. Um, as I said, it's always available as a spreadsheet. Um, I tell people that if you're gonna use some statistics to always do a search, um, not to rely on a report because those reports are those moments in time. But this shows you um, an example of all the definitions of the tags that are up there um, and the contributing factors. Um, we also have a page that shows the longest incarcerations. This is everybody that spent more than 25 or more years um, and it's now more than 200. Um, uh, and it's, I don't know what you call it, whether it's a, I'm not going to speculate on what you want to call it, but it's it's quite an interesting. We have uh, a couple other databases. Um, Pre-1989 cases um, means the exoneration occurred prior to 1989. So why does the, the main registry start on January 1, 1989? Uh, because the first DNA exoneration was in 1989. So it seemed like logical fence post to move forward from if, you know, you talk about the modern era, um, the, the era, the death penalty, the era, and the modern era, I think criminal justice is shaped by the introduction of DNA into the system. Um, this case, the pre-1989 cases are far less detailed in data, um, in part because it's often very difficult to find out a, a lot of uh, information on these cases but they're all vetted um, and they meet the criteria. Uh, uh, Megan Kushno is uh, someone who is basically in charge of that. I, I shouldn't have left her off that original lift list now that I think about it, but she does these um, um, because she likes doing it and she does a fantastic job at it. 
um, I always tell people if you if you think of someone who's should be in there and it's they're not in there, they should tell us. Um, a lot of times I'll talk to lawyers, defense lawyers, and say, "Have you had any other cases?" Oh, no, no, no exonerations. Well, what do you mean by that? And people have different definitions in their head of what an exoneration is. And if I say, "Well, have you had a case where someone got reversed?" and was acquitted at a retrial and there was new evidence that was not introduced at the first trial. Well, yeah, well, welcome. That one qualifies. The group's registry um, is um, just a couple years old. Um, that's Ken's baby. Um, this is uh, a, it focuses, as it says, on groups of defendants tied together by a common pattern of systematic official misconduct. Typically, these are um, cases where there's corruption among police officers that's discovered. I think we have close to 2,000 in Philly. Um, they range from that many to lesser numbers. Um, some of the cases that are in there actually qualify for the main registry, but a, a lot of them don't because they don't get the same kind of scrutiny um, that individual cases get. And, and by that, um, I mean that the, for instance, in Philly, um, Brad Bridge was in the public defender's office and, and he, when they had these scandals, police officer scandals there, um, he would identify, you know, a hundred cases that in which these officers were involved and walk into court with this list and they would just matador them out the door um, because the officers were their credibility um, had been challenged and, and undermined. Well, there's likely a lot of guilty people in there. Um, we try to keep the main registry to people that are, in fact, meet the criteria are an innocent. Now, does, does that mean there might be some people who could make it through there who might be guilty? Um, yeah, I mean, that's just a fact. and. What I like to say is that we keep out a lot more innocent people than we let in guilty people. We do our best um, to keep it as, as, and the fact is by having the criteria, um, we rely on the criteria. We don't have to make a judgment. Um, it's not our subjective judgment. It's, it's the process. Does it meet the criteria? Does it meet the process? Um, so here's an example. I just gave this presentation to the public defender's office in El Paso of how we can, uh, and that's why it's Texas, and how we can pull out um, data. Um, so it shows that there's, as of December 1st, 437. In, and since 1989, 14 prior to that, there are two groups. Um, this is a comparison, a side by side, where you can compare it to the national and say, you know, how are we different? Well, look at the, for, as an example, the pleading guilty, 26% um, in the registry, but 64%. Why is that in Texas? Well, that's largely due to the fact that <clears throat> several years ago, um, Harris County found out that they had all these lab reports that were coming in from the lab to the DA's office mailbox for uh, prosecutors to pick up for their cases where people had pled guilty. And so they, they didn't pick them up. Um, people had already pled guilty. Well, they started, somebody said, there's a lot of stuff in here. We got to clean it out. And they started looking at them and they found a, um, more than 200 where the results were, you know, controlled substance were found. And so there was a, a campaign to vacate um, all those convictions. Um, when you see the comparison there and how high the no crime cases is, same reason. Somebody pled guilty to uh, something that wasn't a crime, that there were no drugs. Um, here's a breakdown um, by crimes. And you can see that those six crimes there are the, make up 86% of the registry crimes. Um, and it's about the same in, in Texas. 
but you can see the difference uh, when you look at drug possession and sale um, and, and, and see that sort of explains, uh, you know, that what I was talking about a second ago. Um, you can break it down by race. Um, and, and sex. Um, these are this is a breakdown by the contributing factors. And cases can have more than one contributing factor. Some there's a few in there that have uh, the full Monty, all six of them. Um, but you can see that the two predominant ones are perjury, false accusation, and official misconduct. Uh, the CIUs, um, as of this date, and this is already out of date from when I presented this last Friday, because we just added a case Monday out of Tarrant County. Um, Monday or Tuesday, out of Tarrant County. Um, but this shows how we can break it down by unit um, and um, that 43 uh, and, and 53 don't have any yet. Some may never, I don't know. Um, this is a breakdown uh, of the, by units. Um, these six units have 77, three quarters of all of them. Um, the Harris County ones, uh, that's those drug cases driven uh, largely by those drug cases in Cook County. It's also driven by um, a um, huge number of drug cases that were um, all funneled through the Conviction Integrity Unit where they looked at all the cases. Um, and it was a, a bunch of corrupt police officers who were um, basically framing people who wouldn't um, either snitch on others or pay them off. Um, innocence organizations, um, we track those. Um, and that large number in Illinois is fueled primarily by um, these cases. The uh, Exoneration Project at the University of Chicago has, uh, with Josh Tepfer, has um, taken the lead in all those. It's Sergeant Ronald Watts scandal. And you'll see, you can get a, a great summary of that scandal in the group's um, registry. Um, this is, um, shows the uh, number of CIU cases by year and the number in, in which uh, innocence organizations were also involved. Um, and you can see how that's really grown. And I think that's a, a great sort of demonstration of, of, number one, the trust in CIUs uh, by innocence organizations and the, the level of cooperation um, that is occurring um, to basically exonerate the innocent. Um, we try to be as transparent as we can. We share our source materials um, when requests are reasonable. Somebody calls up and says, I want all your source documents and all 300 plus false confession cases. Well, let's be reasonable here, but we will. Um, uh, we And we do, we share um, source materials with um, academics who are doing uh, research projects. Um, and um, when people ask, we share them with students um, uh, all the time. Um, we want to correct our mistakes. Um, we get emails from people saying this isn't quite right, and we'll get to the bottom of it. Um, you know, I worked as a journalist for more than 30 years, and if I were to say I never, never was in the correction box, that would be a lie. Um, we make mistakes, and so we want people to tell us. Um, something that most people don't know is we don't have direct contact with exonerees. Um, unless they reach out to us, um, that's the only time. And the simple explanation of that is we're a three university project and there are human subject research protocols. And so we chose to um, handle it this way. And so that was the hardest thing for me as a journalist when I first started writing these summaries and I would have 
a question about something that I couldn't find in the source materials, and I would say to Sam, well, can I just call the exoneree? No, I can call their lawyer. So um, that is basically the rule of the game. Um, and that's my little show. Um, I, I know that Jessica wants to talk a little bit about the um, CIU uh, survey, um, but I'm willing to open it up for uh, um, questions and I don't even know what time it is if I'm early or late. Great, no, did great Maurice and Steph kept it right on time. Um, we, if guys, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. You can even probably just go ahead and ask because there's only about 50 of us on today, which is relatively little for us. Um, I did have a question myself, Maurice, on the next to last slide, you said about sharing source materials that you have in reasonable requests. Um, is that referring to the pleadings that you said that you uh, collect or do you collect more than the pleadings when you're doing your research on cases? Well, it's basically the pleadings, but it's it, it can be news stories. It can it can be um, it's whatever material we gather that we use to code and summarize the case. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and um, and I, what we, I will say this: we re, we we reply uh, we rely on public documents. If someone wants to give me a, a um, you know something that's under seal or we don't want those. We want only documents that we feel that we can share. And do you ask for things like trial transcripts or things below like digging deeper than the pleadings or you generally want to stay on the pleadings alone? Well, if we can get trial transcripts, they're great. Um, they're not always gettable. Um, sometimes they are. Um, and then of course those allow us Depth, uh, more, allow us to code things a lot better because you can go back and see you know did the forensic analyst say um i've looked at the hairs in this case and um to the exclusion of all of their hair heads head hairs in the world it's you know john smith's which is just you know it may not be in a pleading it may not be laid out as specific as that right? Um, and so that's where trial transcripts can really be helpful um, in getting us to, I'm getting a little competition here. Yeah, I'll, I'll let folks know that that's Maurice's canary in the <laughs> in the room with him, which likes to be a part and, of the call. And so. I covered the cage in hopes that he would, you know, <laughs> but it won't, it won't, it's hearing me talk too long, so. So I did put in the chat for folks the link to the registry itself, as well as a link to the uh, write-up about the Sergeant Watts cases that Maurice mentioned. So if you want to kind of go ahead and do that. I will also put in a plug for asking for the data. Um, I've done numbers of presentations on like women who have been exonerated, on racial disparities and exonerations, and uh, just I, you're able to ask for the data multiple times. It's not just a one and done thing. You, they will let you download it as many times as you want. And so doing so is very, very helpful for us. But I do also kind of want to welcome in Jessica. Uh, so Jessica's focus is primarily on with the Conviction Integrity Units themselves. So she's the one who's responsible for all the write-ups uh, that appear on the registry as well as in the in reports on the work of CIUs. And I want to kind of let her take a couple minutes to talk about that and how she gathers that information. Jess? Thanks, Marissa, and thank you, Maurice. My name is Jessica Weinstock Paredes. I am a research scholar. I'm a former public defender, so I litigated criminal defense cases in Miami-Dade County, Florida, and Hillsborough County, Florida, before joining the registry. Um, I do everything that Maurice claimed I did and a few other things. I do track our CIU data. We you know, when, we, when I first started tracking CIUs, we had a list of 38. Today, we list 96 on our website. So it has grown very much in, in track with my tenure here at the registry. And through that process, we've had to decide, you know, a couple criteria and definitional things. Um, what exactly is a CRU? What exactly is a CIU? Um, because we see them blossoming and showing up in different ways that we didn't expect at attorney general's offices and, 
you know, some are sort of a traditional trapping of a prosecutor's office where it is an in-house um, organize, you know, part of the prosecutor's office that's most common, but then we have other efforts that we learn about that are committees um, of volunteers. And so we have to kind of decide what are we at the registry going to call a CIU um, as far as qualifying for our list. And really all that we require um, is that you're engaging in conviction review, that it's operational, that it's funded, and that it, that it has a staff, that it has at least one full-time attorney dedicated to the review. Um, we also require that you are not necessarily producing exonerations, but engaged in the conviction review process for the purpose of exonerating someone. Um, so we don't count um, conviction integrity units that only do um, sentence reviewers, you know, sentence commutation work or things like that. But for the most part, I think our list of CIUs is comprehensive. Marissa and the folks at the Quadrant Center are very helpful in keeping us updated on anyone that we're missing because this is just part of what we're doing. Our main core work is, of course, publishing exonerations. My goal is to keep in touch with all of you, for you to know about the registry, for you to know how to get in touch with us. And that's why we conduct our yearly survey. Annually, I send out an email. You'll see me and usually a, a law student or graduate student who's assisting me um, send out a uh, hello. It's usually the end of the year. Happy holidays. And um, we used to collect a lot of data. We used to collect data about the structure of the units um numbers how many petitions are you reviewing how many are you denying um you know our bandwidth is limited now to us just making contact and making sure that the exonerations that we attribute to your unit you agree with and are correct and we leave sort of the more robust data collection to the quadrant center and they're doing such a fabulous job with that we really just want to know if we've missed anyone or if we've attributed a case to your work um, in error. And that happens. Um, as Marie said a few times, we don't know what we don't know. If you know something that we don't tell us, we get this information from a variety of sources and we may have listed a case as a CIU case and really it wasn't. It was the appeals unit in that prosecutorial office that handled that case. Um, or we may have six of the seven exonerations that you've processed and we just we just missed that seventh one. It wasn't publicized. We, you know, we didn't catch wind of it. So we want to be in touch at least annually um, to make sure that we're reporting on your work. We, if you've been responsible for an exoneration, we want to be sure to capture that. We want to be sure to publish that on our website. Um, we want to be an authority on a comprehensive list of operational CIUs nationwide. And we want to be crediting all the incredible work that you guys are doing. So I do send out that survey. The first round went out a couple of weeks ago at the end of November. Um, if you see it in your inboxes, it came from my uh, student assistant, Joanna. And we'll be sending up a follow up next week um, for anyone that we haven't heard from. So we do love hearing from everyone. We are happy to talk about all the things that Marie's discussed in depth uh, over email, or we can set up a call. And we've done that a few times, especially for brand new units. We've had individual Zooms with them and, and just showed them a little more closely what we can provide, what we can, um, how our research can help you in your work. Can I share my screen for one second, Marissa? Absolutely, go right ahead. I just wanted to show you all um, what the Excel spreadsheet looks like. So from our website, if you go to um, get data as a spreadsheet here on the website, you populate the information and what it's going to give you is an Excel sheet and some pretty rudimentary um, skills in Excel will let you filter all the different variables that we code for our public facing codes from Excel and anyone, I mean, I I didn't have a lot of familiarity with Excel when I started, but you can pretty easily filter the public spreadsheet and create a data bank for whatever it is you're looking for. If you're looking for defendants who at the time of the crime were 16 and it was a homicide and their case involved official misconduct, and one of the contributing factors to exoneration was inadequate legal defense. You can filter all of these 
categories in an Excel sheet and generate really seamlessly a little data collection of the exact cases that are akin to whatever kind of case you're working on. And that's just the public data. The back end um, coding that Maurice was talking about, we can do that for you. So if you contact me and say, you know, I've downloaded the public spreadsheet, but do you have anything on recantations? And, you know, what kind of more granular coding do you have on what goes on during interrogation in a false confession case? We can assemble whatever variables we have that might help you and put those in a spreadsheet just like that, and you can do the same thing. Whittle it down to a data set that is most useful to whatever whatever it is you're arguing, you know, in your motion. Um, so I just want to make sure you know that that feature is available and that it, it goes further than what you see on the website. We can manipulate these views on the back end of our software and SharePoint and, and create a collection of whatever variables um, are most relevant to, to what you're looking for. For our CIU web uh, webpage, it's right here under issues. And I can almost be sure that there's at least an error somewhere on this. Um, it's just the three of us, Maurice, Ken and I, who are full-time staff at the registry and maintaining the CIU database is just a part of what I do. So annually during the survey, um, it's a great opportunity, not only for unit heads to alert us to any exonerations that we've missed, but also any information that we've failed to correctly link to on this page. Um, a lot of times we list a unit the moment we learn about it. Of course, Marie, Maurice and Ken, as soon as they see the news story, they funnel it to me and we get right to work finding out whether or not it meets our criteria to list it, which means that I probably link to the DA's office or the state attorney's office before the CIU dedicated page is even operational. And we simply don't have the bandwidth to be shepherdizing these things all that frequently. So the annual survey is a great opportunity for you to not only look at the exonerations that we attribute to your unit, but this the street address, right? The link to the website, anything you see that needs corrections, please let us know. Um, we're very happy to, to keep that updated. I do think that, you know, at least some incarcerated persons use this website and this resource to get in touch with you um, to find out where to send their questions and their petitions. And so it's very important to us to make sure this information is accurate. Um, in a perfect world, when we have a bigger staff, we'll have someone who is constantly shepherdizing it and reading through it and checking it. But for right now, um, we do appreciate your input and um, you know your communications with us about anything that needs updating. We're going to hit 100 units soon. We're just a few away, and um, you know at the registry, we we love your work and we applaud it, and we're excited to see so many CIUs producing exonerations. Thanks, Jess. Um, could, could I? Uh, go ahead, Maurice. I'm going to just. Uh, I was going to share my screen to show you the coding form. Uh, yep, you can go ahead and do that. Jess has to get me the first. That's okay. We'll take it. Okay. Yes, that was the question I was going to ask is if you can show that so folks get an idea of what Jessica was just talking about the additional factors that you're looking at that they may that? want to look at. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so this is, uh, it's it's 31 pages in a PDF. Um, and it starts with just basic demographic uh, information. Um, is it part of a group, then here's where we code the tags um that come into play this is the stuff that will populate into some of the, the public data um we have the date of the crime the date of the arrest um and we have um here's an example of so the month if if they were arrested released arrested again use the date of the last arrest um they're a little we have by the way we have a coding manual that goes with the public um spreadsheet um that has definitions and um that's available as well um 
some of the data that we collect that here's an example of, of, of data that we've shared and that's mental disability. Um, we've shared that with some researchers who have done work on that. Um, we, we try to crack, uh, uh, try to track prior criminal history. Um, this is pretty, we don't consider this a very reliable um, code. And this is something uh, that we have not. Uh, the only time I can recall that we ever shared it was with Keith Finley at University of Wisconsin, and it was on a confidential basis where they were looking at trying, trying to uh, uh, amend the Wisconsin compensation statute. And he was curious about the Wisconsin exonerees, how many of them had past records, um, because sometimes states want to uh, make past records something that might bar someone from uh, compensation. Um, we have a worst crime category, then these are things that, that um, will populate um, as it goes down, why was the defendant suspected? Um, and we have, these are the categories where they identified by a, an eyewitness, including a co-defendant or a victim, were they picked out of a mug book? Was it an informant? Was it because of their relationship with the victim or relationship to another suspect? Um, these are all things that we um, individually code. Um, then we have a whole series on victims. Um, this is where the race comes in, uh, the relationship um, of the victim to the defendant, um, ages of the victims, um, and so on. So I'm on page nine. Let me, here's where we categorize, where we code the conviction. If someone is convicted and gets a new trial and gets convicted again, and then is exonerated, um, we code the first conviction. We also code the second conviction. Um, you'll, you'll see this comes up. But, um, and Morris, as you're going through this, might be good. There's a question in the chat about whether you code for compensation. Whether yes, we, yes, we do. Um, and I'll scroll quickly down to that. But here's where we get into a mistake, um, or was it a lie, um, false ID? Um, was the person identified by the co-defendant? Um, and some of these are. Um, this is, was it a tainted identification process? Um, and we have different reasons for it to be tainted. Um, let's see, this will, will it find, will it do a search? It would help if I could spell. And Jessica, while Maurice is looking for that, if there's a question in the chat about whether, particularly with the CIUs, um, you at the registry kind of identify, you know, underperforming or uh, CIUs that may not be living up to best practices, whether you take policy positions or this is just about the data itself? Um, we're all about the data at the registry. Everything we do, we keep as clean and objective and conservative as possible that extends into CIUs. We don't make a judgment call um, as in a formal capacity as researchers at the registry or, or personally. I mean, we understand that some of these units um are in tiny jurisdictions with limited resources and uncooperative DAs or whatever the situation is we absolutely don't make a judgment call on production some of the CIUs that are on the list on our website for having produced no exonerations are doing other incredible work um compassionate release during the time of COVID sentence commutation so the only reason um that we break it up into those two lists of of um units that have produced exonerations and have not is for website operability and and you know an easier way to find information and exonerations it's not a judgment call we don't spend any time scrutinizing the work of the CIUs you know it we at the registry put the information on the website the information about CIUs the information about exonerations and it's for public consumption it's up to the researchers and the journalists and the policy makers to make of it what it is we protect the integrity of our data and everything we report fiercely and we can only do that if we are if we remain objective and rely on the numbers and report the numbers 
Thanks. And it looks, uh, Maurice, like you found the site you're looking for about compensation status. Right. Um, and um, I will say this, that I mentioned Jeff, Jeff Gutman, um, uh, who, if you look under the compensation um, drop down on the front of the website, he has some interesting reports and a database and he tracks it. Um, he provides us with more information than we provide him, but he, he does statistical analysis um, and um, can say how many people in this jurisdiction got compensation of any form, whether it's by legislative um, act, whether it's by state compensation, whether it's by um, state lawsuit, whether it's by state court of claims, whether it's by federal lawsuit. Um, and so we go through this um, periodically and update it. Um, and um, one of the things I wanted to scroll down and show you that um, we keep track of is um, there's where we tag those. Um, I miss it. Um, factual basis of exoneration. This is something that um, we we try to track as well. And this is um, where we put in what what was the reason for the exoneration. I'm trying to see if there's a little drop down there or not. There it is. Um, was there DNA? Was there other physical uh, or forensic? Was the real criminal arrested, charged, or confessed? Was the real criminal identified or described? Was there new alibi evidence? Was there evidence showing um, no crime? Witness recanted? Um, that's something I can show you quickly. So we have, this is, um, were there any recanters? And a, a recantation to qualify it has to be post-conviction. Can't be um, a recantation during the trial or prior to the trial. So we um, code whether it was an adult, whether it was male or female, whether it was a victim, the year of the first recantation, even if there were multiple, was there evidence that was out there of innocence that was raised before someone recanted? Um, what were the reasons? What were the, the subjects of it? Um, was it about the currents of the crime, the identity of the perpetrator, uh, the certainty? Um, you know, I, I said it was the person, but I really wasn't sure. Um, I said it was the person, but I knew it wasn't. Um, but the police told me they were going to charge me with the crime unless I said it was that person. Um, uh, did the person confess? They recanting that the person confessed to them. You see this in a jailhouse snitch situation where it's like, well, they never really did tell me that sort of thing. Um, why did the person say those things? Um, was it because they were threatened with criminal prosecution? Were they promised things? Um, were, they get, were they threatened? Um, was there some official pressure to identify photographs during a lineup? Was there physical abuse? Were there threats um, to take away your kids? Um, uh, and, so, and so forth, and it goes down. Who did the recant or recant to? Now, we haven't gotten a lot of requests uh, for this information, uh, except a couple times where um, people were interested in how many times in child sexual abuse cases did the victim later recant. And that's something we can pull out. Um, and it, uh, I'll be honest, um, I think that our data shows um, just sort of based on my hanging around here long enough, that recantations have gotten a lot more traction um, in recent years, maybe in the 10 years that I've been doing this, um, recording this, that, that they've gotten a lot more traction than, than in the past. And whether what, what is behind that, I, I'm not exactly sure, um, other than a lot, uh, a fair amount of them have been given credibility that I think might not have gotten in the past. Um, we try to rank how important it was. Um, and then we go into forensics. Um, we're working on a 
expansion of that. Jessica knows more about that, but that's going to be, I think, the next sort of coding. Was it fraud? Was it invalid? Was it misleading? Was it a mistake? Um, so anyway, these are all, as I said, boxes that are, uh, was there physical evidence? Um, here are the perjury and false accusation. Were there any official actors? Um, describe it. Here's the OM, official misconduct codes um, that we go through. And so, um, again, uh, these are all internal, um, that's the internal coding. So there you have it. Wow, that's pretty fascinating to me. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we offer an opportunity for folks if they have questions or um, information. But we do did put in uh, the emails both for Jessica and for Maurice if you wanted to kind of reach out to them directly, whether you had questions about your own work, about the data that they're collecting, looking for other information for research that you're conducting, a grant proposition, or just you know, for your own information, please feel free to reach out to them directly. Um, we did launch the poll for the post-meeting evaluation. We appreciate folks filling that out before we jump off. Um, and I'm looking in the chat, not seeing any, any, but I'm going to ask Jessica and Maurice to hang on for just a couple minutes in case folks were a little shy about that. Uh, but thank you both so much for this. I think you know, folks are uh, giving this really, finding this incredibly helpful for the work that they're doing. We're so grateful for your time. And of course, once again, want to plug uh, for the prosecutors on the call, if you've gotten Jessica's email or you haven't seen it, please look for it so that they can keep their data accurate. Um, it's important for everybody that we have that information available because this is such an important part of the story behind the, uh, behind the exoneration registry. But Maurice, Jessica, Ken, thank you all so much for the work that you're doing. And thanks everyone for being on. Uh, we, as of yet, don't have a topic for a January meeting, so that may be just relax for a month and we'll get back to you in February. But as always, uh, we, if you have some suggestions or uh, information you'd like to have through this webinar, please let us know. We've been asked for information on 3D imaging for ballistics as well as some DNA questions. We're working on those. But if you have other topics you'd like to hear, please let us know. We'll be happy to put it together. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Hope everyone has a great holiday. Um, and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mar